So our scripture this week, the first one is from Micah, Micah 6, 8. And it's one we've all learned together before. God has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. So we'll say that together. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Thank you. So then we move on to the third, the fifth chapter in Matthew. And you remember what's happened, right? We have the birth story in Matthew, and then we have Jesus' baptism, right? With John the Baptist, we talked about that a few weeks ago. We had the temptation in the wilderness. Then we had him calling the disciples. And today, today we heard Jesus' first sermon in the Gospel of Matthew. We call it the Beatitudes because that's just Latin for blessed, right? When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And then he began to speak. And he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. Your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now this is the time in this sermon where Doug is supposed to be sitting right back there at that desk and he's supposed to reach and push that button and it's going to drop the screen down and you hear music start to play. Are you imagining it so far? Yeah. All right. And, and what you imagine is a black screen. And these words come up on the black screen. It takes seven seconds to build a prejudice based on someone's appearance. It takes seven seconds to build a prejudice based on someone's appearance. So we invited six strangers to see each other in a different light. It's totally dark in this room. And then infrared light comes up. And you see six people, six men being seated around a table, but they can't see each other. One of them is a wheelchair. He rolls up. One of them is a, a shorter man, slight of build, with a suit coat, short hair, and wire rim glasses. One of them is a Sikh. He, he has a long robe and he has a turban on his head. One is dressed with an Arab headdress. One is a Maori man with tattoos all over his face, his hands, and his arms. One is a guy who looks like he lives next door to you. Short reddish colored hair, a sort of old t-shirt he has on. And they all sit around the table in the total dark. And you hear one say, I play in a heavy metal band. And one, the one sitting near him says, oh yeah, he's got long hair and he wears it in a ponytail, and he's got some piercings, and they all laugh. And another says, I read a lot of books about behavioral psychology. I've spoken at TED Talks. And one of the others says, oh, I know what he looks like. He looks like a nerd who thinks he's cool, but he's still a nerd. One says, what interests me most is aromatic heritage and the Arabic language. 
And one of the others, the Arab says, he's an Arab. The fourth one says, I like to cook. I spend most of my time in the kitchen cooking, of course. And one of the others say, oh, he's mature. He's like cheddar cheese. He's ripened. <laughs> the fifth one says, I'm an extreme, extreme sports guy. I love skydiving. And someone says, oh, you're, you're the active kind, who you let your actions speak louder than your words. And now it's completely dark. And you pause, and the lights come on, and they see each other for the first time. And one says, it's amazing when they turned on the light. Who you see that you've actually been talking with. I was shocked at first when the lights came on, and oh, I see right across from me this tattooed guy sitting right in front of me, tattoos all over. The other says, this is my expectation of you. This is what you really are. Talking about the guy with tattoos, he says, if I see someone like him anywhere outside, I'll definitely not sit and talk to him. And they say about the tattooed man and, and the heavy metal rocker, they say, you two should be swapped. And then you begin to learn who they all are. So the one in the wheelchair, he's the extreme sportsman. The one in the suit coat with the short hair and glasses as a heavy metal rocker. The Sikh, the one who is a Sikh, is the chef who loves to cook most of all. The one who likes to read books and do bas behavioral psychology is the man with tattoos from head to feet. The one who says what interests me most is aromatic heritage in the Arab language. He's your next door neighbor. And you see them all looking at each other with amazement. And the guy says, the I imagine the guy sitting in front of me to look more like you. And the other one says, wow, when I, when I met Garrett in the wheelchair, I was completely stunned. And then a voice says, reach under your chairs and take out the box. And they reach under and they pull out a red box. And when they take the top off, there are two red cans with white swishes on it. And those of us who have been alive since the 60s know what those cans are, don't we? Coca-Cola. But there's no writing on the can. And the Arab man takes it out and he looks at it and then he turns it around and you see the only thing written on the can in white, thick letters, like the words Coca-Cola would have been written in, are these words. Labels are for cans, not for people. <laughs> they asked them later and they said, it was obvious we shouldn't judge people before getting to know them. And one man said, this experience changes your perspective. It changes your mind. It changes your heart. I think that's what we see today when we hear the Beatitudes from Jesus. First, let's talk about what blessed means. In the dictionary, if you go to dictionary.com, there's three definitions for the word blessed. And the third one is really the way most of us think of this word and most of us interpret it. We usually think of it as divinely or supremely favored, fortunate. We might even say lucky. But the first definition is really the one Jesus was talking about consecrated, sacred, holy, favored. Alice McKenzie, a scholar from Texas, says, Matthew, even more than any of the others, other gospels, emphasizes that to be a disciple means to live by the teachings of Jesus. And Matthew wants us to know that to really be a follower of Jesus means to be righteous. And righteousness is about your inward life 
and how it energizes you to seek justice for the vulnerable. She says, Matthew states that Jesus has performed many healings, but the Sermon on the Mount is his first act of public ministry. Scholars like to debate about this text, as you might imagine. You'd be amazed at how few people preach on it, because it's not an easy text. But scholars like to debate about what it means, and we talked about this a lot in Bible study this week. Some say, here's what it means. It means you must obey the Beatitudes to, to be led into the kingdom of God. And others say, no, no. There are rewards available to you if you trust in God. And others say it's the way God is loving you. And Alice McKenzie says the answer between those three is yes. They're not entry requirements. We don't have to meet them for God to accept us, but they completely describe a state of joyful response to God that allows us to actively accept God and to know how to live in the world. In the video, it started out in complete darkness. And it's only when the lights come on that you notice that your preconceived notions about the people are wrong. For most of us, we're still in the dark about the Beatitudes. Most of us know it's a difficult world, and we know that we are supposed to be happy, and we know that we're supposed to get more and more good stuff, because more good stuff makes us more happy. That's what we see on commercials and everything else, right? That's what we tell each other. How many of you remember um, George Carlin? Yeah? You remember that thing he did about stuff? Right? What happens when you get stuff? Then you have to get some more stuff for your stuff. And then you get some more stuff and you fill up your whole house with stuff. And then you have to get something to guard your stuff. Right? And before it's all over, you have so much stuff that you can't do anything but worry about your stuff. <laughs> and and we, we laugh at that, but in many respects, isn't that what we see around us all the time? And if we decide it's something else, if we decide we're actually going to live these beatitudes, people will say to you, that's not the way of the world. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. You're being naive. That's not the way the world works. And Jesus said, that's right. That's exactly right. That's not the way the world works, but that is the way God works. That is the way God understands this kingdom. It is, turns the world upside down. And that was true for the disciples and it's true for us. Can you imagine? They've just left everything they know. They've seen him heal people. And then he says, come here, gather around, and let me tell you something. Let me preach to you. And he comes out with this? Are you kidding? Where are the troops that are going to free all of our people? Are you kidding? What do you mean it's the ones of us who don't have anything? And we don't hear that they grumbled about this upside-down God's world. But I'd be a little amazed if they didn't. We know that over and over again, Jesus seemed to think they just didn't quite get it. The Reverend William Quick, who was a retired Methodist minister, wrote a sermon called The Greatest Sermon Ever Preached. And in it, he quotes this book, The Power of One, by James Merrill. He says, Merrill suggests that the Beatitudes may be more instructive when we invert them or read them backwards. By doing so, they are given a new meaning. We turn them upside down in the way that the Beatitudes turn our world upside down. Here's what you get. The way to heaven is through poverty. The way to consolation is through genuine sorrow. The way to earthly possessions is through a gentle spirit that is not stingy or possessive. The way to satisfaction is through a hungering and a thirsting for justice. The way to mercy is through mercy. The way to a full relationship with God is through the active practice of peace. The way to God's realm or kingdom is through the struggle for right that leads through conflict 
through pain, and sometimes even through death. See, we take these Beatitudes and we try and look at them from a new perspective. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out, can we live this? Can we live into this? Are we ready to turn the lights on so that we can clearly see each other and see what God is calling us to? Or is it just easier to stay around that table in the dark? But the Beatitudes are really like a road map for how to live a whole Christian life. They tell us not so much how we arrive at our destination, but rather they give us a big view of the landscape where we're to live. Now, the disciples heard this first impression of Jesus' sermon, and they were still in the dark. What he said to them is, the world is wrong. God's world turns this one upside down, and to walk with Jesus, it is your job to turn your world upside down. Jesus said that to them on the mount. He said to the disciples, listen, now is the time. This is the way we are moving forward. This is who we are as disciples of God. We are not disciples of the world. We are disciples of God. Are you all in? Are you out? Exactly. And so that's the question for all of us today. Are we all in? Are we willing to go all in for Christ? Will we turn this world upside down? Will you take your own life, pick it up, shake it, and turn it over, and then look around you at the world and what's happening in it and the suffering that people are feeling? Will you take all of those beautiful things you have been saving that George Carlin says, all our good stuff, and will we open our hands and make sure others have enough? Will we be the ones who sit and allow people to suffer, but sit with them in the suffering? recognize and appreciate where their weariness and their suffering is and not shame them for it but hold on to them in it will we be people who seek peace even at the cost of everything we hold dear Will we be people who say justice is important, justice for people, justice for everyone, we claim justice. Will we do that when our neighbor tells us we're foolish or stupid or that we don't understand the problem? Are we willing to have Jesus ask us this question today? Will you go all in? Will you live and be blessed? Will you follow this road map to Christianity? Will you let go of your intellectualism and your envy and your individualism and your material contentment and your categorizing of the world into us and them? Will we turn the world upside down? He asked them sitting on a mountain. He asks us sitting in church. Will we go all in?